This is um, a super event for Christoph Borchert and I, who organized this, and it's a continuation of a very successful lecture series which we had last semester on the distribution of power by algorithms. And this triggered us in a way, um, together with contrast, which we just won at the University of Frankfurt, and Rainer Forst will shortly introduce you to the idea of contrast, that we should actually follow up on this and look a bit more closer on um, algorithms, how they function, whether or not there is a contrast conflict between human decisions and algorithmic decisions, whether they are trustworthy or not, whether they may actually entice trust, whether they need control or whether they can be used for control. And you've seen it all um, that we have created a quite uh, broad view on all of this. Um, and we're very proud to start tonight, um, second week of semester with our lecture series. We have as a guest Borka Schäfer from University of Edinburgh, and I will shortly introduce him. But before I do so, I would like to pass on the word to Enrico Schleif, who is our president at Goethe University, and who has, um, I may say that, uh, won the election as a president also because he wanted to invest in digitalization. And so this basically is the perfect uh, continuation of our presidential program, of a scientific program, and also of Goethe University's international outreach of uh, creating basically a worldwide understanding of where we stand with algorithms, whether there is something like a European third way um, contrary to others approaches, etc. Professor Schleif, you have the floor. Uh, dear Professor Speaker, thank you for putting pressure on me directly on the, the, the fourth month of my legacy. Um, that, uh, it's, it's an honor uh, to open this fantastic event. Dear Rainer, uh, dear Professor Günther, dear professors, dear junior researchers, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. Digitalization is transforming our societies and their basic structures politically, social, legal, and will continue to do so even more in the next decade. And I believe not even we have to wait for a decade, even in the next year. We have to be aware of this and ask critical questions so that we can also accompany and shape these transformations in ways that conform to foundational values like autonomy and the rule of democratic law. But how will digitalization transform our universities? How will we equip our students and ourselves with scientific knowledge? How we attain knowledge and how will the digital transformation research the way we acquire knowledge? One of the main interests today and of this uh, lecture series is to critically discuss the algorithms, the predictive society in light of trust and control by asking the question why and under which conditions do or don't we trust algorithms. Normative orders reveals another aspect to be considered. By asking how much trust, if any, should algorithms put into us as citizens? The viewpoint itself is switched. As Ms. Speaker already mentioned, of course, digitalization is an issue that is constantly being examined at good universities. Scientists such as physicists, uh, the physicist Thomas Lippert, with focus on quantum computing and AI, Volker Lindstrut, this focus on architecture of high performance computing and AI, or Hendrik Draxler, who works as professor for educational technology and recommend the systems and educational data, just to name two, which are uh, three, which are not here today, are perfect examples of how modern research should be designed. A single issue, such as digitalization or cybersecurity, is considered from different quarters, with many different questions by many different specialists. At this point, you see what only university as a mirror of society can achieve, to study, to reflect, to acquire ideas and answer that take into account all relative aspects. At Goethe University, we have already had projects, as uh, the speaker already mentioned, and all of those projects like Das Digitale Selbst, the Digital Self, promoted by the Anna Quant University Foundation, or the conference 
künstliche Intelligenz, wie können wir Algorithmen vertrauen, Artificial Intelligence, how can we trust algorithms, also collaboration of the Forschungskolleg Humanwissenschaften, the Frankfurt Institute of Advanced Studies and Goethe University. Christoph Burchard also gave, as an organizer of today's event, also gave a talk back then, and I think it was a good start at this time point to have a series of discussions, and the speaker already mentioned the last year's event uh, here in this context. So the lecture series starting tonight expresses and continues the desire for an overarching interdisciplinary discourse on digitalization. This course carried out in the best tradition of research as it is done at Goethe University in the best tradition of modern research as designed by and at a university, examining one of the same issue by all possible fields of study. I thank this evening speaker, Boka Schaefer, professor of computational legal theory from University of Edinburgh very much, because his speech will be an opportunity for the unpredictable. He will, I'm sure of, and therefore trustful about that, take us beyond the borders of our knowledge. And of course, I also would like to thank the two organizers of, it, of today's event, again, my dear colleagues Indira Spieker and Christoph Rosen. And I have to mention that uh, Indira Spieker also was uh, recently involved in a very important event, namely in searching and finding for a CIO. And with her critical questions, she was making sure that a CIO does not only consider the technical aspects and maybe the educational aspects, but also that considers the impact of IT on society and university world. Each and every one of you, whether here or on video, is welcome at Goethe University. And hopefully, uh, I wish all of the organizers that maybe one event will be even uh, be possible directly in a seminar room. I wish all of us a very good talk tonight with lots of new impulses. And I would like to thank you for joining this fantastic event of normative orders. And I looking forward to Rainer's uh, talk about contrast because one of the spearhead projects of Goethe University. Thank you. Professor Schleif, thank you very much. And there could no be no better way to pass on the word to Rainer Forst, um, who will present normative orders and contrast, which have both contributed to this lecture series. Thank you so much, mm, Rainer. Mm. Thank you, Indra. Dear President Schleif, dear Enrico, um, dear Professor Schaefer, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much, Enrico, for your uh, kind and inspiring words. Uh, a very warm welcome on behalf of uh, the research cluster contrast, which is a, a recent, uh, recently built, as Indra said, um, a research initiative, uh, which is located at the Normative Orders Center. And I send you my uh, greetings and welcome also on behalf of my co-director, Nicole Deitloff. It is great to have such a, a start of our lecture series called Algorithms Between Trust and Control with Professor Schaefer, who is a great expert uh, on the issues we are interested in. And I thank him for joining us. And I also thank Inda Spieker and Christoph Burkhardt, our co-collaborators and the organizers of this great series for this impressive program. I am also happy that Klaus Günther agreed uh, to add uh, comments uh, to Professor Schaefer's uh, talk. And I look uh, greatly forward to that. Now, why is this new research initiative that we're having, this recent twist to our normative orders agenda, which is funded by the state of Hessen, Goethe University and the Leibniz Peetz Research Institute, why is this called contrast? The answer is as simple as it is challenging and difficult to substantiate. In contrast, contrast, to standard research agendas on trust. We think that many of these agendas looked for the sources of trust in the wrong place. Following a communitarian bias, the premise is, is widespread that trust rests on identity, on sameness, on seeing yourself as sharing a communal bond with others, simply 
You trust those who are like you, speak like you, pray like you, and so on. A further assumption is that trust decreases once societies become more diverse, conflict-ridden, pluralistic, and so on. Such research produces and reproduces often a fantasy of society as a community of Zusammenhalt, as the Germans call it, which doesn't really exist, neither in cultural nor in other terms, if we think of status or class differences, or we could add differences in digital power. So in contrast, we suggest to change the perspective and look at the communicative and especially the conflictual infrastructure of societies and take a second look at when conflicts actually destroy trust, assuming it existed before, which is an assumption one should also look into, and when conflicts actually produce and reproduce trust. Because maybe the very experience of conflict which is, an, which is also an experience of encounter of discourse, leads to a productive development, what we call trust in conflict. For example, you may learn something about others and yourself in such conflicts. You may change your position, but also come to respect other positions. You may understand better the society you are part of and the power din dynamics within it. You see that institutions and procedures can actually generate trust precisely where the illusion of communal unity disappears. Conflict can have, can have a rationalizing power. That is what we're interested in. This we take to be an approach which is more adequate to contemporary forms of life, especially in times of increased uncertainty where the kind of trust we hope for and work for is careful, critical trust, and not the authoritarian trust forms, which often develop in the wake of social crisis. Some forms of trust one cannot trust, the critical theorist knows. Given that approach, which we test in different contexts of research, contexts of democracy, of institutional mechanisms, of sanctioning and control, contexts of the economy, the area of knowledge and knowledge production, and last not least, the media. It is quite appropriate for our approach, I think, to focus in this opening series on the media of trust, if I may call them that, especially the way in which forms of artificial intelligence contribute to the growth or the decay of trust in times of conflict and uncertainty. The algorithmic society, if that is a that's probably a term we're going to discuss uh, during that series, might signal a new normative order. And we want to know more in what ways its own rationality leads to rational or irrational forms of trust or mistrust. And with this, I'm happy to turn over to my dear friend Klaus and end with a note of thanks, apart from my sincere and reiterated thanks to the speakers and the organizers of this series, I thank the great team at Normative Orders for their efficient help in making this series possible. And I thank the other institutions with whom we cooperate, the Center of Responsible Digitality and the Frankfurter Gespräche zum Informationsrecht at the Faculty of Law, where Klaus Günther serves as Dean. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rainer Forst, for this great introduction into a new research agenda, which um, a number of colleagues here at Goethe University will pursue in the next years, and which will hopefully be another stamp on the academic um, setting, basically, as was normative orders before. That was great. Um, Christoph and I tried not uh, to have the limelight taken away from Burkhard Schaffer too much, but therefore we asked Klaus Günther to be in a double function, that is both as the Dean of the Law Faculty, but also as a very trusted and responsible uh, member of both normative orders and of contrast to give a commentary on Burkhard Schaffer's uh, talk afterwards. So what we're going to do away from the typical protocol, and I hope you'll all come along with this, is that I'll now shortly introduce Burkhard Schaeffer, and then after he has talked, I will pass on the word to Klaus Günther to present the law faculty, 
in a greeting word and then also um, to address us all with a commentary and then we'll go into the academic discussion, which we're looking forward greatly. So let me introduce our keynote speaker and um, we picked Burkhard Schäfer for a reason for tonight. He looks uh, like a very nice um, man, which he indeed is, um, but you will find out that he has quite a sharp mind and that he is willing to speak his mind in his lectures quite openly. I have rarely seen a colleague which is as interesting, inspiring, creative, who never says the same thing twice in his lectures as Burkhardt. So um, it's a shame, and I really mean that, um, that uh, he has basically studied a number of subjects. In the chat, uh, I have copied in his uh, CV so you can all read how many different interests he has pursued as a student. So in a way, he is the perfect student uh, who has turned into a professor to be inspiring, etc. But that also means that he had to land in a country like um, Scotland, uh, the Great Britain, which is sometimes a bit more open than the law faculties in Germany are, which are always looking for the Staatsexamen as a requirement to teach in. Um, so the only way we can get Burkhardt to enrich our German society and academia is basically invite him constantly and fortunately he's willing to join the German discourse quite frequently. So for example, he is part of the commentary on the GDPR um, and English works, which is um, a German work in its core, but also has some uh, international colleagues. That having said, um, Burkhardt, uh, the title of your presentation tonight is another promise of how I have known you so far, and that is being extremely creative. Never apologize, never explain. How can AI rebuild trust after conflicts? Thanks for speaking for us, and now it's all academia. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for the kind introduction. I would say I summarize this as no pressure then. <laughs> um, guten Abend, Frankfurt. Catch Miller Falcher, Hille Dunjorn, and Hermatsch. That was Gallic, and uh, just wishing you 100,000 welcomes, just that you know how I spend my time in lockdown. Um, I'm trying now to get um, my PowerPoint up, and let's keep fingers crossed. Ah, that seems as if it works. That is excellent. Um, and now I need to, oops. Yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot again for, for, for the invitation. I'm really thrilled to uh, speak to you tonight. And uh, first, a quick word from my sponsors. Um, we started two months ago. The uh, UKI, UK uh, Research uh, and Innovation um, Organization, the Trusted Autonomous System Initiative, which is a four-year project uh, sponsored, supported with um, 11 million pounds from the British government and matching industry funding to create a hub and spokes model that will trying to look at uh, all the aspects of um, AI and how to make it trustworthy. So there are going to be, or there are uh, seven spokes um, that deal with uh, specific issues in the field of AI from trust as a specific uh, spoke to responsibility, resilience, security, verifiability, and uh, that's the old version, uh, legality, which had become uh, legal and uh, regulational uh, issues. And uh, in Edinburgh, we are in particular responsible for that uh, node, the better governance by design node that tries to work together with these other systems uh, to develop over the next uh, four or five years a vision of how trusted AI could look like. And when I look at that, um, in a way, we, we tried to do quite a number of the things you are also trying to do uh, in contrast. We tried to uh, have an interdisciplinary approach in Edinburgh. Uh, we have colleagues from um, STS, from anthropology, from law, and from computer science working together. But uh, if I look at it from a slightly different perspective, then we have been much, much, much less ambitious and less willing to take risks in what you are doing. Because in many, many ways, this still follows the traditional idea that somehow we can organize trust, we can design for it, we can avoid problems at the moment of inception. So it is a conflict minimization approach, which I think is very typical to what we have done in AI in the past. And uh, 
people who grew up with, with Ulrich Beck's risk society should remember how futile this is. Um, there's never a perfect security. Things will go wrong. And all the methods that we introduce to make our life more trustworthy and, 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 and less risky, they create their own uh, risks uh, in, in, in turn. So looking at conflict, looking at things that will go wrong and have gone wrong, and then to ask, um, what can we do after that? Where, where are we left then? Is, I think, an extremely important and extremely bold uh, approach that you are taking. Uh, and I do hope that there will be opportunities between our two networks uh, to work together quite extensively. And the topic that I would like to talk uh, about today, that might actually be one of these points of, of intersection. Um, it is about uh, apologies uh, from and by AIs, uh, so to speak, uh, apologies. <clears throat> and uh, I do apologize for, for, this, for this rather terrible pun, um, but it won't be the only one. So uh, what, what uh, do I think about uh, apologize, apologies as a research field? I think it is something that requires the interaction between HCI, human computer interaction, uh, crisis communication and business studies, psychology, linguistics and speech act theory, and eventually also the law, all of them contributing from different perspectives what we can say about apologies and their connection to explanations on the one hand, but also crucially their connection to trust. Um, when I started to look into this topic, um, then um, I had something slightly different in mind and it was really only by, by working on this for, for the last uh, year or so that I realized uh, what the connection to trust and conflict actually is. But before we start, I want just to say, uh, two or one or two limiting conditions. Um, some definitions of apology require a specific mental state for a sincere apology, regret or remorse. And we only apologize because we feel in a specific way, internally, mentally. And if we understand uh, apologies in that way, then it seems to be obvious that AIs, that robots are not able to apologize in that sense. Um, so it should be clear from the beginning that when I'm talking today about apologies, I'm thinking more about something like that. Um, FCK apologizing that they were running out of chicken uh, and, and therefore having a shortage. Uh, they did this extremely efficiently. They did it in a humorous way. They did it in a pleasant way. And uh, it contributed to the business success in quite considerable ways. Here's an example of a, a business that failed to apologize in the right way. Uh, it was um, a passenger getting forcibly removed from an airplane and uh, potentially because of a racist profiling um, and the company failed to apologize in an appropriate way and as a result suffered quite considerably. Now in both of these cases and even more so in cases of state apologies, um, we are not primarily interested in a mental state of the person who is doing the apologizing. That could be a spokesperson, that could be a press office, that could be the CEO, but still we do not necessarily expect them to have a specific type of mental attitude uh, when they are issuing that, that apology. So if I'm talking about apologies, I'm, I'm talking exclusively uh, in the sense of, um, or almost exclusively in the sense of a company or a state issuing apologies for their actions. I'm also not going to cover uh, the uh, converse um, issue, uh, not to, to, tonight at least, simply for time reasons, uh, whether or not it is sometimes appropriate for us to apologize to AIs. Um, one of the things that, that I and others have um, noticed and, and worries us to a certain extent is uh, the way in which we interact with some of the AIs brings back patterns of behavior that uh, one thought would have died in the, in, in the 50s, the latest. Um, if you think of Alexa speaking with a female voice, always obedient, always there for us, and then getting shouted at by men to do their job, uh, that, that is a type of conceptualization of interaction that, that we do not necessarily want to get um, amplified. So one related issue is indeed uh, under which conditions could it be appropriate to apologize to an AI, but I'm not going to, to cover this uh, tonight. Um, 
as I said, the, the uh, value of apology, quite a bit of the literature there comes from uh, business studies, in particular crisis management and crisis communication. A typical paper like this, uh, the value of apology, how do corporate apologies moderate the stock market reaction to a non-financial corporate crisis, um, finding quite uh, consistently that apologies can play an important role to reconstitute trust after it was violated. So uh, at a point in time when trust has uh, suffered uh, through uh, an, an event, apologizing in the right way can play a significant role to um, restore this trust. Um, a little bit of background, what got me to this topic? As I said, it had nothing to do with trust as such. It had to do with explainable AI and the GDPR. And that is a topic um, most of you uh, will be familiar uh, with. Uh, there's a significant discussion uh, whether or not uh, the GDPR through Article 15 and Article 22 gives a right to an explanation. Um, here's Article 15, uh, the existence of automated decision making um, requires uh, a right to meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and the implicit consequences of such processing for the data subject and uh, recital 71 of the GDPR. In any such cases, such processing should be subject to suitable safeguards, which should include specific information to the data subject and the right to obtain human intervention, to express his or her point of view, to obtain an explanation of the decision reached after such assessment and to challenge the decision. And as you know, this has created quite a bit of discussion what that exactly means, what the duties are, what uh, uh, the impact of the uh, non-binding recital are. And one paper in particular that um, created quite a bit of uh, attention was by uh, Wachter, Mittelstadt and Floridi um, about hypothetical feedback. And the model that they envisaged for uh, a explanation that uh, is on the one hand doing something good, but on the other hand sufficient to meet the requirements of the GDPR is uh, a hypothetical. If you had done X, if you are going to do X in the future, you will get what you want if you adjust your behavior accordingly. So for instance, an AI decides you're not credit worthy uh, and explains this to you by saying, if you repay um, your previous loan for another six months and in that way show that you can handle debt, then you would have been successful in uh, your application. So, so that became a, a, a quite um, influential model, I think, uh, to think about uh, the way in which we should think about um, explanation and explainability in AI. And it has by now generated a small cottage industry on computational approaches to implement that. Now, what we should note uh, in, in this approach that obviously it is not always suitable. Um, it is in particular not suitable when backward engineering is unwanted. Um, if an AI stops a financial transaction because of concerns about money laundering legislation, uh, then it shouldn't explain it by if you had split the transaction into two uh, chunks of uh, 449 pounds 50, then you wouldn't have been rejected by all money laundering detection software. That is obviously not the type of appropriate explanation that we should anticipate under these conditions. Um, so that is one of the limiting approaches here or the limiting conditions. It also assumes that it is not a one-off situation, that it makes sense to think about future uh, interaction with that specific organization or that specific AI. It gives advice how to adjust my behavior towards that entity in the future and therefore doesn't work necessarily in one-off situations. And it also assumes, and that gets us closer to, to my concerns uh, that, that triggered my interest in apologies, it assumes that it is the AI that is right, always, isn't it? It assumes as an of default that the decision was correct uh, and um, it assumes that I have to change my behavior to get my desired result, but not the AI. Now it is true that it can indirectly give clues to a challengeable decision. If the uh, AI tells me, for instance, if only you had been born a man 
or next time around try to be a little less black, um, then obviously we will realize that uh, the AI made its decision on uh, unacceptable grounds, it was biased, and we can use this potentially to, to get a remedy. But honestly, would you want that as an explanation? Or would you feel, even though it ultimately might help you, that insult was here added to injury? So I started to think about a way in which we can invert Wächter's scheme uh, in those situations where it is not um, the fault of us or the failing of us that needs to be addressed, but the failing of the AI. So the Wächter scheme of if you had done X, you would avoid Y becomes I, we should have done X to avoid Y, and then possibly something else. And the something else could be, we are sorry, it won't happen again, have a drink on us, um, here is something for free to make up for your trouble. So um, there are several possible ways in which one could uh, continue an explanation of the form, we should have done X to avoid Y, um, it wasn't your fault, uh, it is our behavior that needs to change. And that looked to me to be quite similar to what we would normally call an apology. And that then raised the question, can we think of apologies as a form of explanation? And what exactly is the relation between apologies and explanations on the one hand? Uh, would they be sufficient from a legal perspective um, to comply with, with Article 15 and uh, 22? So that started in a way my interest in, in that intersection between apologies and AIs. Um, in an ap apology, what we would normally expect is um, that someone takes responsibility that they say something went wrong and it was because of us. There was a unjust action and harmful action and either it is our responsibility or, and that's my addition, I at least benefited from them in an unjustifiable way. Uh, it indicates that I'm aware of the harm that resulted from that action. I'm not trying to minimize the harm. I'm not trying to convince you that you don't feel what you feel. I acknowledge that harm occurred. I also, indicate that I will behave differently in the future, which is of course why uh, the apology with which I started wasn't an apology at all. Um, and I immediately in the next speech act took it back when I said you will actually get a couple of puns uh, throughout this paper. Um, and as I said, for some authors, it expresses certain emotions, especially regret or remorse. Um, that is obviously not the case for AIs, as I said, but uh, there's nonetheless some sincerity conditions that need to be met for an apology as a speech act being successful. Now, one of my favorite uh, admirals, um, he is the person who gave actually the title um, to the talk. It was John Arbesnet Fisher, and uh, he famously said as a motto, never deny, never explain, never apologize. Um, that's possibly the saying for which he became famous, uh, but he became even more famous or should have become even more famous for being the first person who used OMG in the meaning of oh my god. Uh, and if you don't believe me, uh, that is the actual letter to Winston Churchill where OMG here in the bottom is for the first time used. Uh, and as he from the explanation marks today, you would probably use a Twitter clapping between the three letters. Um, so, so he was in a, every sense a rather interesting character, strong-minded and opinionated, one might say. Um, but this notion that, that we should not deny, uh, explain, that we shouldn't apologize, um, that was later on taken up by, by quite a number of people. Uh, and no one more famous probably than John Wayne here, uh, never apologize, it's a sign of weakness. Um, and that is really where, where, where for me the issue of trust suddenly came in and when I realized that and when I was reminded of, of this attitude to apologies. Because what is trust ultimately? Um, trust is the willingness, I apologize for this uh, title of, of the slide again, uh, as a willingness of a party to be vulnerable to the actions of another party based on the expectation that the other will perform a particular action important to the trustor, irrespective of the ability to monitor or control that other party. 
a quite influential definition. And, and for me, really saying something utterly crucial here, trust comes with risk, trust comes with vulnerability. Uh, when we are trusting, then we are vulnerable. And if this trust is violated, then what we can expect uh, as a question of fairness, of restorative justice, is that the other side also accepts a degree of vulnerability. So in a way, um, John Wayne is both right and both wrong when he says that apologies are a sign of weakness. Yes, they are, but that is a feature, not a bug. It is uh, restoring the specific type of injustice that a violation of trust means, that is um, exploiting someone's vulnerability by making yourself vulnerable in return. Um, can we think now of apologies as explanation? Now that is a much, much more complicated question. I won't be able to go into much detail, um, also because it differs significantly on the type or in the way in which different cultures apologize. Um, uh, this study here by Barnund and uh, Yoshio Iko, a uh, very interesting study, looked at the way in which uh, people perform apologies in, in these different cultures. And um, one interesting uh, result was that uh, the American apology typically included an uh, explanation. And with that became always in the danger of becoming an excuse. Whereas the Japanese apology typically did not contain an explanation and indeed uses the there can't be excuses phrase as a sort of standard intro into, into an apology. So one of the things we see here as well is that apologies and how we apologize are highly cultural specific. Um, and that in itself potentially sets it apart from what we mean with an explanation. For explanation in the theory of science, we have a couple of theories, the influential deductive nomological model by Hempel and Oppenheim, the statistical relevance model by Salman, the causal mechanical model, Salman uh, again, unifications model, they all claim universal logical validity. Um, if you look at the AI literature, causal mechanical explanations are, are one of these big challenges and indeed one of those things that our research team is uh, going to look into. Um, but they all assume that uh, we can determine independent of culture and context what a good explanation looks like. With apologies, it is very, very different. They are highly cultural specific. The reasons when to apologize, how to apologize, what to include in an apology vary significantly. Um, these uh, beautiful items, by the way, are, are obviously famous monsters from uh, Japanese movies. All of them have destroyed several cities uh, as part of their life. And that is them apologizing, giving a press conference, apologizing for destroying Tokyo over and over and over again. So apologies, unlike uh, explanations, potentially at least, uh, have a much greater variance if you look at it in cultural comparison. But even within cultures, we find very different ways to apologize. And uh, here's uh, probably the most trivial one, uh, bumping into one. If you do this in Britain, you apologize. And it doesn't matter if you um, were at fault or where the other side was at fault. And the speech act, the linguistic act is exactly the same. It is more a um, verbal signal, I am here. I acknowledge that you are here as there as well. Um, it is not taking on this type of responsibility. So um, not only is apologizing culture specific, even within uh, cultures, there are very complicated rules to choose the right apology, the right words for the right context. Oh. That's what the guys in Yale are up to. Um, and uh, there, there's, there's quite a bit of, of literature by now on um, apologies, robotic apologies in, uh, human computer interactions. And what they do indeed show is that they are quite efficient, not only to create initial trust and a conductive collaborative atmosphere, but that they are also capable of restoring trust after uh, a crisis, after trust had partially broken down. So one interesting study, for instance, uh, looks at the way in which a robot guides people out of a burning building. And the way the, the test is set up is it makes 
almost deliberate, well, definitely deliberate mistakes at the beginning doesn't respond in the way we expect a trustworthy entity to behave, but makes up for it later on through an apology. And uh, there was very clear uh, evidence that um, these robo-apologies do have a trust restoring function. Now, I find this worrying and fascinating in equal terms, because as I said earlier on, uh, it is crucial for an apology that it comes with a degree of risk for the entity that makes the apology, um, that it restores vulnerability. And obviously, robots in that sense are not vulnerable. Um, we do know that timing is key. Um, again, another study along similar lines, finding that uh, a robo um, apology works best if it happens very, very quickly after uh, the incident in question, um, possibly because if we take more time, we start to think about what exactly is going on here. And we realize that potentially we are merely duped by the machine. So typically what we find here are Wizard of Oz uh, type of experiments. Uh, they try to find out how people would react if the AI or the robot were able to make apologies. They have prepared scripts. They lack totally context sensitivity. That is, they respond to different groups and uh, in different contexts in exactly the same way. And they also lack a causal understanding of what they were doing. Um, so they do not really understand what their mistake was uh, they just realized there was a undesirable outcome and then they're using a prepared script um, to, to issue that apology speech act. And all of that, I would say, makes them maybe more trusted, but not more trustworthy. And for me, then the big uh, question becomes, how can we um, add to this? How exactly would it look like? Would it even be possible to have a more meaningful way in for an AI to apologize um, that um, does not rely, rely on deception. Um, some of the evidence how this could be done, as I said, comes from crisis communication business studies. Um, again, a study that showed how efficient apologies can be to restore um, through promises and apologies after a breakdown. Um, here, another one pointing in the same direction. And for our context potentially quite interesting is a consistent finding that competence-based violations of trust are easier repaired through an apology than integrity-based violations. So if I apologize for my terrible English or for not speaking German because my German these days is even more terrible than my English, then this is an apology for a competence. And apparently that is reasonably uh, um, efficient in, in restoring trust after it broke down. However, if I cheat you, um, if I lie to you and I'm found out, if I violated that trust um, through intentionally violation of accepted norms, then apologies tend to be much, much less efficient. Now, the good thing is, obviously, if we are dealing with AIs and robots making mistakes, we are typically dealing with competent-based violations rather than integrity-based violations. They will not cheat they might be used for cheating by a third party, uh, but they obviously uh, do not cheat uh, out of their own volition. Um, what complicates and makes this issue easier at the same time is the law. And that is the final component of uh, the things I would like to consider for theory of apologies. We do know again from considerable research that very often people that rely or resort to the legal system to get justice are feeling ill-served by the types of remedies that the law gives them. They do not want money. They do not want to go through a trial that forces the other side to do the right thing. They very often simply want an apology. They want a recognition that a harm occurred, that it was not their fault that this harm occurred. These are the things that seem to be um, most in the mind of many people who are wronged, for instance, in a medical context. Um, but the way in which our liability law ver works, our delict law works, makes it often very complicated or difficult for entities to apologize efficiently and timely. Because of that, a couple of countries have created a legal framework for apologies. Uh, and Scotland did so as well uh, through the Apologies Scotland Act in 2016. Uh, there is no equivalent of that in England, 
So um, if you are mistreated by a doctor in Scotland, you can expect a slightly different treatment uh, than uh, if that happened in England. It's not a, an isolated case, so in specifically in the US, there are quite a number of states that have introduced the uh, Apologies Act. And what they typically try to do is to carve out an opportunity to apologize without at the same time assuming full legal liability. And that makes apologizing on the one hand easier, and we might even think we are more willing to trust our robots to make apologies on our behalf. But as I said before, a key part of an apology is to make yourself vulnerable. And if that very vulnerability is now taken away again through legal action, then we can wonder if it is still capable of achieving its end. Um, the way the Scotland Act, Apology Scotland Act, uh, defines a apology is that you have to state that the result is wrong. This should not have happened. Uh, you should give a reason why it happened, and that is where explanation and apology uh, again um, overlap, at least to a certain degree. You should give a statement which lessons you learned how you are going to prevent the same thing from happening again in the future. Um, you should have an expression of regret, sorrow and sympathy for that bad outcome, but that is not uh, mandatory in the law. And you should assume again direct or indirect responsibility for it. It gives a reason why it won't happen again. It gives an indication of the remedy. Sometimes simply saying sorry is not good enough. Sometimes you actually have to change. And that sets, I think, this type of apology apart from the one that we had so far in HCI discussions, but also uh, quite a bit in uh, the um, business uh, discussion on, on crisis management. Um, you are undertaking here a commitment and again, if you look at the psychological literature, it is the interaction between a promise and an apology that is particularly restorative for trust. Promises alone do not restore trust after it was broken. Apologies alone do not restore it. The combination, however, can be quite powerful. Um, already had this. Um, now, can it be done? So that is essentially where I'm, my thinking is at the moment. Um, robots will make mistakes inevitably. Um, this can lead to a breakdown in trust. To restore this trust, we need meaningful apologies. A meaningful apology is one that uh, not only explains why something happened, but can uh, take binding commitments that it won't happen again in the future and uh, make good, come up with a remedy. Can it be done? Uh, how, how is the technological side? For it. it is obviously considerably more complicated than what uh, we've done in the Wizard of Oz approach that, that HCI uh, has been using very often. Uh, the next slides contain some really wild speculation on my side, and some of the reality-based viewers may find offensive. Have a guess, I apologize, should anyone take offense of this? Uh, but I would say at this point in time, um, from a logical perspective, yes. Um, what we are dealing here is something that in legal AI has been quite extensively studied by uh, authors like Henry Pracken, uh, for instance. Uh, the idea that a legal explanation as well is in the form of a default rule. That is, um, we do not have strong inferences whenever a, a set of conditions obtains, then a certain consequence follows. But um, they are explanations with a weak or defeasible inferences of the type, for instance, normally if X is the case, then Y should follow. And when new information comes in, that creates a defeater for this rule, blocks the inference, and from that we can then infer that the original outcome, the original decision Y, needs to be revoked, and we can do that linguistically in the form of an apology. So on this relatively high level of abstraction, um, once you are able to have explanations at all, turning them into an ability to apologize is, um, I would say, technically feasible. Um, what, what you need is a degree of uh, defeasibility logic that, as I said, has been studied quite extensively, not the least within the field of legal AI. 
Um, the problem is, however, twofold. Firstly, again, uh, the empirical data indicate that efficient apologies are really highly casuistic and case specific. Um, here it, uh, in uh, his crisis management biopology, for instance, uh, develops a apologetic ethics, which is um, extremely case specific, much, much more similarities to a Aristotelian virtue ethics than, than to a Kantian rule-based ethics, but even, even further than Aristotle, um, looking at highly specific contexts to get the apology just right. And that is obviously difficult to program and to anticipate. Uh, the bigger problem, though, is we can ask, why did the AI not get it right in the first place? What prevented it really from uh, coming to the right result? So in order for the AI to recognize its mistakes it requires, obviously, a two-way communication. We need to have an ability to update the AI, to give it a reason uh, why, why its original answer was false, and then to update it. Now, remember, a sincere apology is one where lessons are learned and they are not repeated. So you would really have your constantly moving target. It should not be necessary to uh, apologize for the same problem twice. Uh, inductive learning is exactly not what we want here to a certain extent. Um, so we have an ongoing process with a, a constantly moving target and we need a possibility to sort of authoritatively feed back and give a reason why that specific decision was inappropriate. That is a real challenge. And the type of things we are looking into is in particular collective uh, data assurance and reality assurance, if you like. Um, something you might be familiar with, oracles on blockchain, for instance, the ability to ask more people for their opinion if you disagree with an outcome. Um, this type of outvoting the AI as a form of giving it authoritative new information to make it rethink its first decision is one of the things we are looking into. But just between you and me, and because this is obviously not recorded and will not go any further than just the few of us, um, I'm personally slightly skeptical about my own approach there, or at least I think it runs into some really fundamental anthropological and philosophical differences between us and AIs. We are fallible beings and we know it. We live our life in the constant fear of doing the wrong thing. We live our life in the constant knowledge that we don't know all the things we ought to know to make really safe, secure and uh, right decisions. That shapes us as human beings. And I think that still sets us apart considerably from AIs uh, who might know a lot, but they might not know what they don't know. And without, again, that vulnerability, um, that ability to accept that we will fail and uh, as a result respond to it uh, in inappropriate ways. Uh, that is, I think, something that is very, very difficult to render computational. So I think some things can be done. Some uh, aspects of trust restoration can be automated uh, for specific types of contexts. Uh, but we shouldn't expect it to be quite as efficient to what we as humans are capable of doing. And with that, I come to the end of my talk and I obviously, uh, the management apologizes for it. Um, I couldn't give you any definite answers. I, I was more hoping to give you a vignette of ideas that come from very different disciplines and for me start to um, develop a, a picture at least for future research. So the only thing that remains me to say is sorry, 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 so sorry. And Robolov means never having to say 1110010011011101. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Burkhardt, for this fascinating talk, um, for, for really uh, giving us an idea of where things are or where they could go. Um, so my job now is to moderate the discussion and I'm very glad to, to have Klaus Günther break the ice um, with um, a short welcome, of course, uh, in his function as, as the Dean of the uh, Faculty of Law and then uh, to also give a, a short comment, uh, like an initial one, um, 
and then we'll we'll jump right into the discussion. Klaus, thank you so much uh, for for being with us today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my problem uh, I have now is that I'm because uh, of this fascinating talk by Burkhard Schäfer, uh, my head is uh, so full of ideas which he uh, inspired. Uh, that I have difficulties to keep them together. And so I would, I would like to be very brief uh, with my uh, welcome uh, address, uh, just uh, say that uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, the law faculty um, is participating in this uh, lecture series and uh, that this is one of the uh, great uh, results of uh, a joint venture of all the institutions uh, which were already mentioned uh, by Rainer. Um, uh, to make this uh, possible um, and uh, I'm looking very much forward uh, also to uh, future uh, exchanges and uh, corporations because uh, the law faculty of Frankfurt um, uh, just begins or is in the wake of um, uh, creating a research focus on uh, AI and uh, digitalization. Um, and I'm glad that we have this lecture series. Um, so it's, um, um, I, I, I fear that I could only point to some um, uh, um, topics uh, in this um, presentation of uh, Burkhardt. Um, and uh, I hope that I grasp some of the important uh, uh, issues and I try to, um, ask or comment on, on three um, points, which of course are related uh, to each other. Um, the first one is um, about this uh, right to explanation, um, which as you mentioned is also central uh, for the GDPR in Article 15. Um, and um, I'm wondering, uh, and, and I found it very um, convincing to uh, associate this right to explanation with the um, question why uh, explain um, and that it might be in the background related to to uh, something like an uh, apology from the point of view of uh, if one takes this uh, relation into uh, consideration i think the um, the the interesting question would be what does an explanation contribute uh, to the practice of um, apologizing. Um, and um, I was then thinking about um, whether an explanation is something like a first step in order to find out uh, what is really, um, uh, what, what of, the, of the, the event or of the, of the action of someone um, is really the part for which an apology would be appropriate and what not, or which, which part would be not. It came to my mind, I mean, uh, Stra Pierre, uh, Peter Strawson's uh, distinction between the internal and the uh, external point of view or participants and observers point of view. So an explanation, I mean, you refer to all these um, uh, scientific uh, uh, theories, uh, what, what is an explanation, how to explain the explanation, and it all refers to the observer's point of view. And, and, it, and from the observer's point of view, we can find uh, causal relations um, which are as such not appropriate for an explanation, and, uh, for, for an, for an uh, apology, which can be explained. And, if there is an explanation that I was bumping in you because um, it happened to me um, and I couldn't have done otherwise, I mean, then we accept that ex mm. as an explanation, and then I, I, my, my, my uh, perspective changes. I'm looking at you from the observer's point of view. Ah, that that happened to you. You couldn't have done otherwise. Um, so um, I, I don't ask for an apology. Uh, although this might be polite to say I'm sorry, but we know that mm -hmm. it's not really a, a reason for being sorry, uh, because uh, this would presuppose something like I could have done otherwise. Um, and so a causal explanation would not be sufficient. 
Um, and um, yeah, that that might be. Um, and, and then, of course, I mean, uh, the question would be how, what about a robot I mean, who, who can only be described from the observer's point of view? And, and what, how would we understand an apology of a robot um, um, from an observer's point of view? Mm. Um, or is it really, would it really be possible to change into the participant's point of view? With Robert, I mean that 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 would be the, uh, I think the 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 um, uh, irritating question, and and this brings me to to my to my next point. That that's about, I mean, the 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 example you presented from from this Yale uh, um, video. Um, yes, but I mean, do we really? take an apology from the robot as a robot or because we um, uh, somehow frame the robot in an anthropomorphic fashion. So how much anthropomorphism mm -hmm. is in all the examples uh, of robot apologies um, you presented that we either think well, behind the robot, there are human beings who programmed the robots. And if the robot says, I am sorry, we, we, uh, we understand it as the human beings behind the robot, behind the robot, um, they are saying, uh, I am sorry. In fact, also the robot is the, uh, uh, the messenger <laughs> to, to, uh, to present that. Can we really separate our anthropomorphic attitude or participant? And this again brings me back to the participants' point mm -hmm. of view um, uh, in in a communication. Um, can we really attribute that to to the robot, or do we somehow fantasize that there is something like a human being and in 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 uh, uh, in, rea uh, in 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 the way we perceive uh, the, the robot, we perceive him either as someone representing a human being um, uh, or something like that. So that we um, relate the apology uh, uh, again to, to a, a, a human being that, that I'm not sure whether, I mean, that, that would, and, and, and if I mean you demonstrated in uh, at least in the in the in the in the video and also when I mean I think in, in the case of companies this is more obvious. I mean if if uh, KFC say, uh, uh, see, uh, says I am sorry for uh, not uh, having enough chicken, I think we are we are disposed to attribute this apology to the CEOs or other human beings who. Um, are in charge or are responsible for for the company, and we we do not at least completely attribute it or exclusively attribute it to the uh, to the company as such mm -hmm. as an institution uh, uh, separate from human beings who um, um, who are members of that uh, of the of the company or who are the CEOs. Um, but I think what what your example indicate is uh, and this just came into my mind whether uh, the way apologies are practiced are perhaps a part which is internal to human interaction and and that might explain why it is possible um, to let a robot say something which then somehow um, evolves or um, yeah, evolves within this interaction situation um, because we are somehow um, our practice or when we are participating in the practice, we are participating, let's to put it briefly and bluntly in something like a pattern. And when we are in this pattern, um, we take even uh, the apology as a, of a robot 
as an as a something like a token which is in this pattern and working in this pattern and so we are reacting mm. and this could for uh, for at least some time or for some situations be separated from from the from the uh, from the entity which is uttering an apology because when it is uttered after it has been uttered it is uh, doing its work in in human interaction or in, in in human communication by its own it could be separate but i mean that i think that's that's a difficult um, um, hypothesis uh, perhaps uh, but but it, it could indicate or at least it could um, um, make it uh, an interesting question or turn it into an interesting question to look for how apologies are working independently of the one who ad who, who uttered them in in human uh, uh, interaction and uh, that therefore the robot might be an interesting thought experiment uh, at least uh, to to analyze uh, um, uh, this um, I think uh, my next point, uh, it, it's correct to distinguish between trust and trustworthiness um, and that uh, it's easier to restore trust uh, with a robot than uh, trust uh, worthiness. Um, but when you, in the end, um, uh, were thinking about uh, how could it be done, um, shouldn't one add that just to say I'm sorry or to promise that I shall change my behavior in the future, that I take responsibility for my future behavior because I, uh, <clears throat> I accept that uh, uh, um, um, my, uh, my action was wrong, um, that there is an additional element uh, and I think restorative or the restorative justice uh, studies focused on that I really have to do something it's it's not enough just to say well I am sorry and I promise ah, I will become I mean we know all that yeah so, yeah, yeah you just can say I'm sorry and I promise uh, from now on I will change and the next day we know ah, uh, nothing will happen so there has to be demonstrated in reality that something really is uh, will be done or that has been done in order to to prove um, that these were not just mere words uh, which were just said and i think that could also be um uh, difficult with a with a robot i mean at, at least the robot then has to do something which can be understood as something which represents or expresses the apology um, and and the promise to change oneself, um, and that has to be perhaps explained or somehow not explained. I mean, there is a symbolic meaning in these uh, consequential actions out of. Um, uh, 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 as as following from an uh, apology, which have to be understood in a social setting or in a social practice, as representing um, uh, an, an apology. Um, I had a last remark about uh, trust and 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 Hannah Arendt. Uh, I try to to put it brief. I mean. Um, what I've, I mean, when Hannah Arendt is talking about trust, she relates it to, to human freedom. So the, the vulnerability results from the fact that um, there is a contingency in human action. Uh, and this makes us vulnerable because we can never have certainty about uh, the future action of uh, another uh, person and even not to ourselves I mean we don't know what we will do uh, 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 tomorrow and and um, I mean uh, and, and apologies I think in, in Hannah Arendt have an interesting relation to uh, to, to trust because I mean um, um, uh, destroying trust um, 
taking responsibility for that somehow puts the one who committed a wrong into something like a cage. It, 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 uh, it ties him or her to the past action. And so destroys the freedom and the possibility to, to act as a free person because there's always this past behind me which, which ties me to that and, and uh, puts me into the cage. And so that apologies also have the meaning um, to, to liberate me from being tied to the past. And so to be able to act free again and and uh, to make me also vulnerable again uh, uh, and and to uh, enter into a new trust relationship as a free person and not as someone who is determined by this past wrong uh, uh, which uh, he committed and I'm wondering whether if, if that's something like a, um, a plausible explanation of the relation between apology and, and trust, whether this could also be true for robots, um, whether mm. we would consider them as free entities uh, who um, uh, could restore trust by an apology in order to regain their freedom. Um, but that's just a mm -hmm. <laughs> last remark. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope I have not spoken too long. Mm -hmm. mm -mm. Thank you, Klaus. So Burkhard, um, um, now I have to be very strict time-wise. So please, uh, um, I mean, I presume that, that you, um, from, from what I gather, you probably be able to talk uh, for hours now on that, so so please don't 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 use the hours, just the minutes. <laughs> only only water and food uh, really stands in my way now. Um, yes, no, absolutely. Thank, thanks a lot for for these comments. Uh, there's very very little disagreement between us. Um, that's a, that's the first thing to notice. Uh, the one thing I found interesting in the existing examples of HCI is these were students who interacted with the robot, informatics students. They really knew what was inside the box. Um, it was programmed by their PhD supervisors. And nonetheless, um, simply when you use the normal measurements, it worked. And I found this fascinating and worrying. And you're absolutely right. This is partly because of this over anthropomorphization. Uh, they do not even ask I think, was this then attributable to the programmer, uh, their, 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 their PhD supervisor after all? They were not at fault for not giving that thing enough memory. I mean, that, that just doesn't enter. And nonetheless, it, it, it fulfilled its job. And that's why I'm worried about that thing. So it's, it's at least partly also to, to raise a certain degree of alert uh, about the deceptiveness of this. Um, the reason why I bring in um, explanation is partly exactly because of that. Of course, explanation allows them to have verifiable changes of behavior. If I know why it's something went wrong and promise not to do it again, these two together then allow that external scrutiny, the external position to say something has really changed. And that is exactly what sets a sort of deceptive approach uh, apart, I think, from, from a more substantive one. From a legal perspective, the question then really is, does it hold to um, the entity that is legally responsible for the AI? Can it make uh, binding commitments on, on, on behalf of that entity? That's why I brought in the Apology Scotland Act, because that creates a sort of rather ambiguous relation between the doctor who apologizes and the NHS trust on whose behalf they apologize. To a certain extent, the trust gets in, but not fully. And I think we would need for an AI framework, a legal framework, something similar, not identical. You're absolutely right. Robots are different. They are, they are, they are, uh, and, and require their own terminology. But something along these lines. And then finally, on the freedom side, the one aspect that I didn't mention, partly because of of, of time, partly because I didn't know that you would be my my respondent, uh, was 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 forgiveness, um, because that very often comes up in in some of these studies as a third factor: promise, apology, and mutual sincere forgiveness and they together restore collaboration and trust. I didn't talk about forgiveness, but if you again think of truth reconciliation commission, 
processes like that that try to lead to this. They create freedom, but I would say crucially for both sides. And that is if you think of the philosophy of, of uh, robotics, uh, David Gunkel's uh, approach, the relational theory of, of robots and robot rights. It isn't that you want to set the robot free, because I don't think that that computes, <laughs> but yourself. Um, by, by, by forgiving, you, you, you liberate yourself from this past injustice. It really works with humans in both directions, with robots at least into one direction. So I think that is where the, the freedom element and the um, uh, liberation element do come in through, through, through that concept. And then we can ask, what would that mean in, in that specific context? So that, that's very quickly what I, what, what I wanted to, to say about that. Um, Chair, I don't know if you saw this, but I have a direct message from Maxim Borosimov also, uh, who wanted to ask a question. Wasn't sure if that was just going to me or also to you. No, that, that, that just went to you. And uh, so, so maybe Maxim can write me, then, then I'm doing the, 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 ah. the, 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 the queuing yep. um, might, might be fairer.